Dr. Copeland, um, yeah. as you know, we are producing a history archive for the society and interviews with pioneers like yourself will be an important part of the archive. So I want to ask you a few questions. In 1967, when the first human heart transplant was carried out, you were a medical student at Stanford, where it all happened. What can you remember about this period of time? Did it make much of an impression on you at the time? Yes, uh, that, that's, that's really a great question for me because uh, I got into the art, uh, transplant lab when I was a medical student. I went to my advisor and he said, we can get you a job collecting urine in uh, dogs with uh, stimulation of the nerve to their bladder, or you can work with this uh, new resident of Dr. Shumway's. His name is uh, Dick Lauer down in the basement of the Palo Alto VA, and he's doing heart transplants. Didn't take me more than a millisecond to make the decision that I was going to work with whoever this was uh, in the basement of the Palo Alto VA. So I did work with uh, Dick Lauer for about three or four years until he went to Medical College of Virginia, and we did heart transplants. And then I wor worked with the subsequent uh, transplanters there as well, and that was right uh, in the early and mid-60s. So when 67 came along, uh, Dr. Shumway announced in the Palo Alto Times, the Palo Alto Times, big deal, right? <laughs> and it never got past the Palo Alto Times either, that we were ready to do heart transplants in humans. And, you know, having been in that lab and worked in that lab for about four years now, uh, I thought he was completely off his rocker. I thought he was crazy. You know, there were too many problems, the rejection, uh, just the transplantation itself. Of course, in dogs, it was a tough, tough model, and it was hard to get those animals to survive. But we, we thought it was premature. And then in, uh, in, in that year, the first transplant did occur. So it was, um, it was a bit of a shock. And uh, the, probably the most shocked person of all was Shumway. <laughs> but the shock came down to us. And, uh, you know, I was initially shocked by reading his announcement in the paper because I thought this was a pretty bold statement, uh, even though it didn't get past the local papers. But then when it actually happened, that was even more of a shock. So was there more, a lot of frustration on your end that you actually weren't involved in the first human heart transplant? No, no. It wasn't frustration. It was excitement mm -hmm. that it could be done because... Uh, you know, I'd spent uh, a lot of my time, and you know, of course, I was just a medical student. I worked part time there, about half a day for three or four years. Uh, but I was really excited. I thought, you know, now we're we're getting off getting to there. a start. And because the reason I'm asking is, it's always portrayed as a sort of rivalry between Shumway and Barnard, and that Shumway was sort of frustrated after this event for the rest of his professional career that he wasn't the first one. Was this your impression too? Well, I think there was an element of frustration. There was an element of being usurped uh, because Shumway and his team, and there was a, a big team, a lot of people, that, a lot of people that never really get credit uh, that worked on transplantation in the laboratory. So I think for that he was frustrated and upset, but I think that he was excited at the same time that, you know, that his work had been accepted by somebody else and that this thing was going to spread. Uh, throughout the world so um, and he wanted to get on the bandwagon of course sure. quickly and get started and the problem at that time is that uh, as, as with many new technologies that are high risk you take the very highest risk patient and you do the procedure and then you're disappointed that it doesn't work and of course that happened over and over and over again during that first year people didn't really know who to transplant they didn't know who to select because uh, it had never been done before. So mistakes were made and fortunately, uh, you know, Dr. Shuma used to say you've got to have this dogged persistence and keep going after things if you want something good to happen and he, he persevered whereas a lot of other people stopped. There was a moratorium on heart transplantation after that first year, but Stanford continued and a few other programs continued. But I, th I think in general, the, the whole atmosphere was one of excitement. It, it really, it was not bitter. It was not a frustrated environment at all. It was a very exciting environment to be in. Coming back to your own career, Jack, 
uh, when, at what sort of stage you decided to pursue a career as a cardiothoracic surgeon? Well, you know, after I'd spent some time in that heart transplant laboratory as a medical student, Dr. Shumway used to say, you know, once a guy does a heart transplant, you've got him by a certain part of his anatomy. And it was true. Uh, I got to do some heart transplants as a medical student. Uh, you know, I got people were helping me do these. And I, I really got to perfect surgical skills even at that level. So I, you know, I was hooked uh, from that time on. And uh, I pretty much decided that's the way I wanted to go. The only problem was for me, these guys worked so hard. I didn't think I could work that hard. And so I started off in medicine uh, and I decided, well, I'll be a cardiologist and I won't have to work that hard, but I can still work with transplants. And then the uh, National Institutes of Health uh, surgical opportunity came along for me and that's where I went. I went, I had to switch from medicine to surgery and, and, uh, and I went into Dr. Morrow's program at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, same, Bruce Wrights came, followed me the next year and uh, Ed Stinson was already there. So we already had uh, sort of a core of people that were really excited about transplant and I spent the next two years doing cardiac preservation and cardiac transplantation research. So, um, that was, that was really the turning point in my career where I, I really made up my mind, this is what I'm going to do. This is exciting and it's fun. I know that Norman Shumway had enormous influence on you and in many ways so uh, you modeled yourself on him. Can you tell us your first impression uh, of the person, the man and the surgeon, Norman Shumway? I think he was, he was he had a tremendous amount of sort of instinctual behavior. You know, he just kind of did the right thing. I remember the very first time I ever met Shumway. I was coming out to a meeting in San Francisco. Uh, I think it was American College of Surgeons. And I knew I had to meet him at the meeting somehow in order to get a residency in his program. But we hadn't really figured out how we were going to do it. We hadn't called. We hadn't done any formal communication. And so I was just walking around the exhibits, and there he appears, and we shake hands and start talking, and the next thing I know, I've, I've got a residency at, at Stanford. He, he had a knack for being in the right place at the right time and for having, uh, you know, this intuitive uh, ability to assess things and, and march in a, in a reasonable direction uh, that was uh, very remarkable. He was, he was pretty calm, and I think it was... It was really based upon his laboratory experience. He was so confident that he could make things happen from having worked in the dog laboratory for so many years on transplantation that when it came to doing people, that was pretty easy stuff. And that's the impression I got from him, that we can do just about anything. Anything with the heart is possible. And, uh, you know, we went into that thinking that came out trained to do it and, and feeling that we could. I got the impression that he always sort of uh, changed the training system in cardiothoracic surgery within the United States in general by establishing a quite a different approach to training. Well, Shumway wanted to uh, sort of uh, skip uh, the general surgery phase of training and go straight to cardiac. And he and, and the uh, board of surgery had battled this out and eventually he lost. And, all of the residents have to go through five years of training and then they do their their cardiac and I think that was a shame. Um, I didn't do it that way. I did, uh, I did two years of general surgery and about five or six years of cardiac and uh, uh, you know there were a number of others who, who just kind of got by uh, at that time but now uh, you know that can't happen. Everything's so rigidly regulated that uh, that people can't do that, but there is a tendency now of the boards to try to reduce the number of general surgery years and expand the number of cardiac years. And I think, you know, he's always been right, and I've always believed that, that they, we have made our young people do too much general surgery. Uh, they become uh, sort of uh, bored with the whole thing by the time they get to cardiac. So I think he had a great idea. Apart from Dr. Shumway, uh, who were the other people who made the greatest impression on you uh, from the Stanford days? Well, I have to say that Ed Stinson was, 
he was more than a role model. He was a close friend and uh, probably, in my opinion, uh, a, one of the very strong pillars in that whole program that made the thing happen. He's an extremely intelligent man and probably technically one of the better surgeons I've ever seen in my life and uh, very fast. They used to call him Fast Eddie in the operating room. Uh, and uh, combining all that in one person was just ideal at that time. That's what uh, needed to happen to make heart transplant a reality. I mean, it was a disaster, really, the first year. But then when he and Chumway, Randy Greep, and uh, Phil Lawyer, and uh, uh, some of the others, uh, Phil Caves, Margaret Billingham, all combined uh, their brain power into this thing, they, they really made it work. And, uh, but I'd say Ed, of all the people who uh, don't get mentioned and don't get credit, deserves a huge amount of credit for his contribution. So the idea of a almost a multidisciplinary team, as we used to name it today, was already established at Stanford at the time. Yeah, it was, and it was it was it just happened naturally. It was yeah. it, again this kind of almost casual uh, way that Chumway did things. It sort of fell together and it worked, and that's the way it happened. Talking about Margaret uh, Billingham, who was getting the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award this afternoon, uh, how did you get involved in these issues about talking about uh, reducing rejection and infection at the same time? Yeah. How was well, I was involved? I was an incredibly lucky guy to have gone through during the period when I did, because I learned to diagnose rejection from Margaret Billingham. I did all the heart biopsies, and then I'd go to Margaret's lab, and we'd look at all the heart biopsies, and we did that for one year. So I saw lots of biopsies, and I learned uh, how her mind worked and her eyes worked when she, she looked at those slides, and it was extremely beneficial for me for the rest of my career uh, to have, have known her. And I continued to tap into her as time passed. Uh, I took her course, I'd have her come down for visits, and because she, she had such a keen ability to diagnose things on the microscopic slides, the histology, that uh, many people just didn't have at that time. So it was a, it was a great opportunity to get to know her and to, to sort of uh, be in on the very first uh, uh, a grading system for rejection. So, and it was really the grading system of, for rejection that allowed us to cut back on immunosuppressive therapy so pe people didn't die of infection because if you over immunosuppress them, they all died. If you played it uh, carefully, doing lots of biopsies, then you had a chance to get these people through. Uh, with uh, less immunopress uh, immunosuppressive therapy than we had used. When you left Stanford and your first position at the University of Arizona, how, how was it for you to, coming from Stanford, which was already sort of a safe environment for everybody, now you were in charge of starting your own transplant program? Yeah. Well, the only reason I went to Arizona was that they promised that we could do heart transplants. Because this was a time when a moratorium on heart transplantation had been declared in all of the major centers around the country, Boston, Houston, Cleveland, everybody had uh, New York. When New York had Reemsma doing transplants in Columbia, and there was uh, Dick Lauer at Medical College of Virginia, and there was a fellow that had moved from Wisconsin down to Birmingham that was doing them in a private hospital in Birmingham, and that was it in the United States. Chris Cabral was doing transplants in Paris, and, uh, and Barnard was doing transplants in Cape Town. So uh, you can imagine going to a, a fairly small university setting and uh, telling people that you want to do heart transplantation. And uh, it was not greeted enthusiastically by everybody. And so it took us two years to crank up and get people ready uh, before we did our first one. But, and that was uh, 1979. So it, it, was a, it was not a very tough process, though, because the University of Arizona at that time, as I uh, used to say, didn't have a lot of ivy on the walls and a lot of people and committees to say no. So they allowed us to move forward uh, at a fairly reasonable pace and uh, get started 
uh, still when there were only about six or seven programs in the world. After you've established your program, you were the first surgeon to successfully use the total artificial heart as a bridge to transplant in a human being, uh, obviously much to the defiance of the FDA. I think there is a famous quote uh, that a greater law than the FDA will, uh, be, will sort out this thing. Can you talk about the events surrounding that time and how that affected the future of the artificial heart? Well, the way we got into the artificial heart business was backing into it. Uh, at Stanford, the, the artificial heart was a no-no. That was hands-off. We're not doing the artificial heart. Although there was, in one laboratory, uh, work on what was to become the Novacor heart going on, it was always felt, this is never going to happen. And that was kind of my attitude. I mean, I went there with the mental set that transplantation would do everything. Uh, after about the first dozen transplants, we had a few patients die of graft failure, almost on the table. And I have almost stopped the program. I became so depressed. Uh, and I decided I'm never going to let that happen again without doing something else. And that something else wasn't really well defined in my mind until it happened again. And when it did happen, and it was funny because Chris Cabral was in town with his wife, Anique and the donor became available in town and I presented the donor to Chris and Anique and they said no I wouldn't take that donor he might be infected and I said I'm gonna take that donor because our patients really sick and I did take the donor and transplanted it a day later we got reports of six positive blood cultures for pseudomonas in that donor and of course the the recipient was failing badly and I called my friend up in Phoenix and said can you bring your artificial heart down. He'd been putting, uh, this was a heart made by a Chinese dentist in his garage. Well, this is a guy that had been working in, at Baylor in Houston, but he had had to make money for his family. So he was trained as a dentist. So he went to Phoenix, became a dentist, and continued to work on his heart. So they brought the Phoenix heart down. And uh, at the same time, uh, we called Don Olson in, in Salt Lake City. Don, can you bring down that Jarvik heart? No one had ever put that in a, a human since DeVries so-called permanent implants of uh, several years before. Don got in a Learjet, brought the heart down, and called all the TV networks. So we wound up putting in the Phoenix heart because it arrived first. It was unapproved in the FDA got their nose bent a little bit about that, but uh, the end result of that was the FDA visited us and said, in the end, if you have a true emergency situation, as such as you did here in Arizona, then uh, you should be able to put in any device, whether it's approved or not, on a one-time basis. And they wrote such a letter and sent it out to all the surgeons in the United States. So it turned out to be a good experience, but uh, the, as they say, it was a good experience, but the patient died. We did another transplant, and again, the, it failed, and so we, we let it go at that point. But then that led to the first successful transplant a couple of months later. We went to Salt Lake City, we trained with Don Olson, and we came back and did the first successful bridge to transplant in a man that did survive uh, for about five and a half years. So. Uh, it's uh, kind of a long answer to your question, but that's the way it happened. So how did the whole area of total artificial heart change from then onwards after these first transplant? How was the public perception? How was discussion within your own team? What happened at your hospital? How was the impact? Yeah. Well, it was a huge impact at that time. I mean, the, the whole country was focused on this. We had all the TV uh, channels, there were three at the time, you know, now there are hundreds, but there were only three main channels in the New York Times and Time Magazine and Life Magazine. Everybody was in town for this. In fact, they made one of the vice presidents of the university sort of the marshal, and he stood at the door and gave out little red dots, and you had to have a little red dot on your lapel to get into the hospital. Otherwise, they wouldn't let you in because the media were were trying to climb over the walls and get in the windows and, and disrupt the basic function of the hospital. I mean, after all, this was just one patient. He was on an artificial heart, but there were hundreds of other patients with lots of other important problems, and, and uh, the goal was not to disrupt the function of the hospital. And um, 
So that took a while to blow over. Finally, when the patient went home, it took him about three or four weeks to, to get out of the hospital after his transplantation. Then uh, things calmed down. And uh, on uh, sort of uh, retrospection and thinking about this whole thing, considering the experience, everybody was pretty pleased. And it was decided that we would continue on with the experience using the total artificial heart. And at the time, could you already envision what sort of impact this whole issue of artificial devices will have on the whole area of transplantation in general? Or were you still sort of not quite sure whether this is, this is something which is sustainable for long term? I mean, that takes us back to 1985. And in 1985, I don't think the, there was nearly as much optimism about uh, mechanical circulatory support devices as there is now. And I think people were pretty much convinced that heart transplantation is becoming the state of the art and the preferred treatment for people with end stage heart disease. But I don't think anybody uh, could really see that devices were going to do this. Certainly there were the visionary statements that are often made perhaps um, ahead of their times that eventually this is going to be the great thing. But in terms of the reality of the moment, uh, there definitely was uh, a lot to prove with artificial hearts. Whereas we'd begun to prove uh, in the cyclosporin era with heart transplantation had started two or three years earlier, really, uh, we'd begun to prove that this is, gonna, this is here to stay and it's going to help a certain number of people. And uh, we realized at that time maybe the number of donors is going to be limited. And little did we know it's going to be pretty severely limited. And, and uh, now the device uh, possibilities are really, I think, much more important than they were. And in terms of the d device itself, did it change dramatically since the early days until, uh, until today, from your point no, of view? No, there's, it's, it's a very simple, lightweight, and fairly small uh, pneumatic device, and it's changed very little since that time. There have been just a few little kind of superficial changes. And as you, know, as you know, today we're using so many different devices. How do you see the role of the total artificial heart as compared to all the other VADs available in the market? Yeah. Well, you know, we've gone through eras. Uh, the first era was when devices came into being and each company sort of had a few different institutions using their device and each institution tried to make their device fit every single patient scenario and every single patient and now I think we've evolved uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so to the to the philosophy that there are lots of devices for lots of different situations and that no device is going to be good for everybody. And that, uh, you know, I think that people are even beginning, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for this too, that people are beginning to see that there is a place for the total artificial heart, that there are certain patients who are so sick and have essentially both chambers, both pumping chambers of their heart affected, who are just not going to survive unless we do something as radical as take their heart out and put in a total artificial heart. Now we're up to about 850 implants of the total artificial heart worldwide. And uh, I think that the experience hasn't been, it's just been ours. It's been, uh, it's been distributed around Europe and around the United States. And, and in general, uh, there's an appreciation that it has a place. And so it is with some of the other devices as well. Now at the same time, we've seen some of the devices phased out, uh, bigger, devices, uh, devices that had tremendous potential and were very good, but for some reason didn't have the money to sustain what it takes to get through the FDA regulatory process, and they've lost out. And, uh, you know, it's a shame that some of these boutique companies have not been able to withstand the financial uh, worries that come with, with this kind of a business. But, uh, I think we're, we're seeing that there are a spectrum of devices, and it's a very interesting spectrum, and some people are going to use this device, and some are going to use this, and some are going to use the total artificial heart. And as you get sicker and sicker, that's where the total artificial heart comes into play. Yes. 
talking about uh, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, you've been one of the founding members, and in fact, you've been the second president of the society. Um, I'm sure that was a very exciting time, and I, I myself went through the history and looked, uh, looked up a few of the details. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the sort of the, the stimulus behind the, the founding, uh, the foundation of the society and the trials and tribulations creating the society and the early development? Well, it started as almost a whim. Uh, I remember walking through the rain to a meeting, I think it was in, it was in Florida, I can't remember which city it was in Florida, that some of us got together, a few of us, the Mayo Clinic, myself, this fellow Jacques Losman, who became the editor of the journal, was there. I remember Michael Kay was there. I'm pretty sure Ed Stinson was there. And we sat down and said, you know, um, maybe it's time to form our own society because we've, we've got this tremendous uh, interest and we need a, a way to speak to each other, to meet together and to communicate. and hopefully to publish uh, information and found a registry and so forth and so on. So that was the visionary group. Then we met in uh, San Francisco, about 50 people, and had a couple of papers presented. And then it went one meeting after the next. I helped organize the next three meetings, Phoenix, New Orleans, and uh, New York City. By the time we got to New York City, we had about 500 people attending, and it was like a, a real society. And we had a journal. It was a sponsored by a drug company, but nevertheless, uh, there were journal articles and it was published on a quarterly basis. And Jacques Losman and I and Mike Hess used to edit all of those things. And, you know, it was a lot of work, uh, but it was so exciting that it didn't really seem like a lot of work. It just seemed like this is the thing to do. Uh, we're learning a tremendous amount. We're interacting with all these great people from around the world. And this, this is going to be something that, that turns into uh, a good thing. So that was the general attitude at the time. And do you think from today, looking back in, in retrospect, do you think we have achieved what, we, what you guys had uh, sort of envisioned at the time? No. I, you, we envisioned a surgical society. <laughs> you know, it was mainly <laughs> surgeons. Uh, you know, I think this has gone way beyond. Uh, I mean, we surgeons and their teams, sort of, the nurses, the coordinators, uh, the uh, pathologists, and so forth, kind of like the team that came from Stanford originally. Uh, but this, you know, what we've seen is sort of what I call the medicalization of the uh, International Society for Heart and Lung Transplant. We have a huge number of cardiologists uh, who have come into the society, immunologists. We have also, uh, we have, on the other side, we have engineers. Uh, you know, we and it, as an open society, it's it's allowed this uh, unusual membership, which is multidisciplinary, to take place. So it's gone way beyond what we thought it would be, and it's it's turned into not only a very legitimate forum, but a forum that is the leadership really for transplantation and device therapy in the world today. So you know, it became much more than we we had ever envisioned at that time. Let's move away from transplantation for a moment. Uh, you're a surgical uh, teacher as well. As a teacher, uh, as you know, there are many sort of uh, very um, um, uh, changes involved in surgical training these days, in particular the changing uh, of the working hours of our trainees. So um, what's your take on this? What, what's your view on sort of reducing the, the, the working hours for young trainees and what sort of advice would you give for some younger surgeons nowadays who want to get into cardiothoracic surgery, number one, but also want to have a career in cardi cardiothoracic transplantation? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a very good question, and it's one that really goes straight to my heart because if I have any regret about my life, and I do have a lot of regrets, but I'd say the main regret is that I took so much time for the professional and so little time for the personal and family. And, um, you know, on the one hand, the, the, the profession has been very rewarding. On the other hand, uh, there have been a lot of dis disappointments on the personal side. And this all could have been avoided <laughs> if there had been some more measured 
way to go through the whole process. So, I mean, it, it was good, but it was bad. And I think the attempt uh, to regulate training hours uh, for young people is a good thing. I think they deserve to have a life. They deserve to have a family. They deserve to see their children. They deserve to have some interest outside of their profession that can sustain them. And um, so I believe in this. I think it's a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think that it does interfere with the basic training of a surgeon where dedication to the patient, spending time with the patient, and so forth are, are very key elements. And um, so I think we're trying to find a balance. I think it's a good thing that we are trying to find a balance. And I would say to young people that are coming into surgery, it's going to be a different ball game. It's not the same game that it was when I went through or, or, or when you went through or for people before us went through. It's going to be a little more humane, but it's going to be a little more of a challenge to become a really proficient technical surgeon and to really uh, be uh, on top of your game in terms of uh, knowing at least some area of your, of your specialty very well. And to go into a position of leadership is going to take even more effort. So uh, again, uh, the element of balance, I think, has to come in and, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, you know, what turns out of this crop of young people, but I suspect they're going to be a little more friendly, they're going to communicate better than we ever communicated, uh, they're going to be a little less self-interested and more interested in the other guy because they're going to have to depend on the other guy to do part of the task. And I think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think. Uh, as a phenomenon, we can see internationally that there's a declining interest in younger surgeons to get involved in transplantation for a number of reasons. Number one is that uh, obviously there is a, they, they think that the decline in the availability of donor organs may, may have an impact on their future careers and obviously the non-very social working hours. What would you say to young surgeons who are thinking about specialized, sub-specializing in cardiothoracic surgery? What would you tell them to encourage them to become transplant surgeons? Well, I think uh, one is cardiothoracic surgery has to be interested in the medical side of heart failure. We have to understand it and we have to work with it. We have to see patients who are uh, perhaps now being taken care of more by cardiologists. Uh, we have to be conversant in the technologies that they use the echo and catheterization technologies that they use, and we have to be able to do some of that ourselves. I think that we have to master uh, the immunology uh, and the uh, treatment of these patients, as well as the surgical uh, part. And I think if you, I don't think we can just be technicians. I think if we be technicians, you don't need very many technicians, but you need somebody who understands the whole process from beginning to end. The other part I would say is that transplantation has reached an asymptote, or it's reached a, a peak uh, of application for now in because it's limited by donors. But end-stage heart disease is going to be treated by a competitive technology, and that is left ventricular assist device placement. And the left ventricular assist devices are so good now that the numbers are going to way exceed what we can do with cardiac transplantation and help a lot more people. So this is a good area to get into, but it's an area where you, you need to know it from A to Z. You can't just focus on the, the, a very limited middle section that involves the surgical placement of uh, devices and whatnot. You've got to have a broader understanding, and there's a job for you if you can do that. I mean. People are, people are very valuable that can do that kind of thing. They're being looked for every day by uh, major centers around the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Copeland. My pleasure.